Hi everybody, this is Damien from Legend Life. Uh, in our Bucklist Talks, we look to talk to travel experts, travelers, and founders of travel companies to get their insights, advice, and inspiration for creating your own Bucklist experiences. So today I have the pleasure of speaking to Richard D. Govea, who's a private uh, safari guide um, based in South Africa. He's also a wildlife photographer. He's going to give us some insights about going on safari in Africa. So how are you today, Richard? Oh, so good. And thank you for having me on your show, Damien. I'm really excited to share a little bit of my piece of life with you and the beautiful places that I get to visit and how to get there. Because it's at the moment, nobody's traveling and it's Everyone's asking how how is it and can we and it's all a green yes let's get out and do it. Excellent. So maybe uh, to get started, you can give us a little bit of background about yourself and then how you came about being a safari guide. Sure thing, Damien. I mean, um, my love for the bush was from a very young age. Now the bush for us is savanna. Uh, it's elephants. It's lions. It's all sorts of different things and. I can remember saying at the age of about seven years old that I wanted to be what we call a game ranger or a guide. Um, and I used to go on these vehicles. We had a timeshare at a reserve called the Pilansburg, which is close to Sun City, if you've ever watched a million dollar. And we used to, I used to hop on the safari vehicle with the guide and I used to chew the poor guy's ear off. And I just loved it. Just being out there was spectacular. And as time went on, my dream sort of faded into the world of, I want to be a businessman, I want to make money, I need to get a degree. And all of these thoughts were shaped by friends, family, and society at large. And I did that. I, I became an environmental consultant. So my love for nature still went into that. And I lost my folks in the tsunami in 2014, uh, or 2004 in uh, Thailand. And that was a ground shaker for me. It really took my life's purpose and put it in a nutshell and said, well, you only have a finite amount of time to sit doing something you're not loving is a problem. So I opened up the computer. I looked at jobs. I said, okay, I want to be a guide. I want to be a game ranger. Let me check. And I looked and I saw that I could earn about $200 a month. So I closed the browser and looked for a different job in a different company doing what I was doing. But it took about a year of that when I realized that it really wasn't about money. It was more about passion and what you could do. I never really thought that this could be a career long situation for me. And I took the dive. I sold everything and I went to be a guide and I have never looked back Every moment along this journey has just been one of great fulfillment and joy. And even through times like now where we're not traveling, the fortitude and the happiness that it provided me has created enough uh, creativity for me to find other ways to make things happen and to bring joy to people and connect me with people like you that I can then chat to and share this passion with. So how long have you been a guide for now? This is my 13th year of being a guide and I've been doing private guiding for around eight years of that. Okay, awesome. So what would be some of your must-see places in Africa? Because you've obviously traveled quite a bit. Well, so I often get this, what's my favorite place to go to? And I think my favorite place to go to is a place I've never been to before. Everyone, and, and I was having a discussion with a guest yesterday, we were having a Zoom chat uh, like this, and he was saying how he'd spoken to a friend who'd said he only needed two days on safari because once you've seen one line, you've seen them all. But that's just not the truth of it. The truth of it is every situation, every sighting, every day is different. And to see them in different locations is beautiful. But I think one of the outstanding things, I love safari, and safari will always be my heart. But the gorillas was a, a really game changing experience for me in terms of people and then the proximity you get to things. I'm used to seeing things from a vehicle, big scary lions and leopards and elephants. Now you climb out and you walk into them and they're three feet from you and you're suddenly going, okay, wait, there's something, there's a big disconnect going on here. So yeah, I, 
every experience is different and there's a lot of places I still want to get to, but for me, safari is still the heart of it all. So, so you were mentioning Rwanda. So when you were talking about the gorillas, so is that a kind of like a recent thing you've done or? No, I've been fortunate. I've done the gorilla treks 52 times. 52 times. Yeah. Um, and, and it's quite crazy because the more you do it, the better you get at it. Yeah. And I think it's, it's like your legend life that you're talking about. The older you get, the better you get at it, as long as you get out your own way and just get there. My first experience with those animals was quite overwhelming because you have the stigma of what it should be like. And it was only at the third, fourth, fifth time that you start leaving those preconceived notions and following your own path and just being present with it. And that blew my mind. And the same thing with safari. You go out and everyone's chasing, I want to see the big five, big five, big five, let's go, let's go. But it's not about that. It's really about being out there and being part of it. You could sit and watch a herd of impala, which are probably the most uninteresting to normal people because there's so many of them. So it's like, okay, we're going past one, we're going past another one. But some of my most amazing sightings have been sitting with them because you didn't know that there was a leopard next to them in the grass. And the next thing, while you're talking about the mating of an impala, a leopard jumps on an impala. And so the subject changes quite quickly. And it's those moments that make safari and, and these types of travel just so unique. Yeah, as you said, I guess like the whole situation is kind of fluid and dynamic. So you just have to be very present because there's so much going on. So if you're too caught up on, you know, preconception about one thing, you, you're not really aware of what's actually going down. Yeah, exactly. And and the smaller things, I think, Damien, the, the, the most amazing stuff is how it all connects together and how the smallest thing can influence the biggest thing. And when you start talking to people and teaching them about how a plant influences things or how an elephant uses a plant as its way of stopping diarrhea because it's been eating too many vitamin C rich fruits, I, that sort of knowledge, when you start thinking and seeing that, you start realizing just how connected, how disconnected people are from what we actually are, which are animals. And how reintegrating with that and being part of it again just shines a light on things and makes life a little bit easier to live and less fearful because it's it's all going to happen anyway, whether you like it or not. Okay. So so what are the primary locations you take people or your guests on safari? So I do trips all throughout Africa and soon to be expanding further around the world. But for the moment, it's anywhere from South Africa, Botswana, Zimbabwe, Namibia, Madagascar, Tanzania, Kenya, Rwanda, Uganda, Ethiopia. So all of these places have different things. And, and even if you look at different spaces like a Zimbabwe, Botswana, South Africa, each one is unique. They contain the same animals, but every experience is so completely different from the next one that you could come back and do safari again and again and again and again. And once that bug bites, and not the mosquito type of bug, yeah. just that travel bug, you can't get it out your system. No, incredible. So for yourself, uh, you mentioned um, one kind of like memorable experience, but what, what are some of the other more memorable experiences you've had? Oh, there's, there's so many, and that's the most common question I get is, what's your, what's your most outstanding sighting? And I don't think that there's one specific that stands out the different types so i'm going to give you two different situations the one was an, an encounter i had with an with an elephant at my room in between safaris so it, it's almost our siesta time because there's not a lot of time in the evenings to sleep you're up having a drink with the guests and eating dinner and making sure everyone's okay and then you're up early in the morning so i was up having my siesta Heard some crunch, crunch outside, looked out my window, and there was a massive elephant bull outside my room. And my house was a, or my room, was a round room with a little pie cut out for a bathroom. So I walked outside in my boxes, had a look. He noticed me immediately. He lifted his trunk and he gave a little inquisitive smell towards me. So I knew he'd connected and everything, and he carried on eating. And eating is 
nature's way of saying I'm comfortable. If I'm still eating, I'm comfortable. Yeah. And elephants, if they're uncomfortable, they'll fake feed. So they'll actually put food in their mouth and you'll see it drop out because they're trying to trick you into thinking that they're comfortable when they're actually not. But by knowing his body language, I sat with him for a bit and then he walked around the other side of the house. So I walked around the other side and before I knew it to, to really shorten things up, this elephant bull was all of eight feet away from me. And I suddenly thought to myself, you've been a bit stupid here, Rich. You've, you've got so close to something that in one swipe, you're game over. But there was nothing I could do about it. So I sat there and I waited. And now I could see the amber of his big eye staring at me. The next thing, his trunk came out towards me, started smelling me so close that I could feel his breath. And he stood there and everything was cool. He was eating and then he stopped. He looked at me and then he dropped his trunk to the ground. He closed his eyes and he went to sleep. He started rocking on his feet like this. Now, for an, a wild animal to go to sleep is his most comfortable moment. He needs to know that everything is cool around him. And I'm a predator. I'm a human. They're, they should innately know that I'm a problem. So I sat there, I am blown away. And then he's snoring. He's and rocking between feet, which they do because of their heavy weight. And the next thing he opens his eyes, checks me out, sniffs me, and then back down and back to sleep again. It was mind blowing. And eventually after about 25 minutes, I thought I'll go catch a nap with him. So I climbed, went back in my door, climbed into bed and fell asleep with the sound of an elephant snoring in the background. So that was a real one-on-one -on -one moment that, that I've had. Um, in terms of myself. And then the second moment was one with guests. And, and I want to bring it up because safari is not just about seeing. The one thing we forget how to do as people who live in cities is use our senses. And we had been with a herd of buffalo, about 500 buffalo, and there were 14 lions that had been hunting them that afternoon. So there was chaos. There were stampedes. Lion had come past us. The lions were unlucky, but everything sort of calmed to a simmer. We went off for a, a nice G&T as the sun set, parked our car. I had a beautiful, a, an amazing professional photographer with me, and we were taking some photos of the stars, and we could hear in the distance the buffalo moving towards us. So you just heard the and the stampede of these hooves moving through, but it wasn't a, anything untoward. So we just switched off all the lights mad Milky Way stretching all around us, above us. And all you could hear were buffalo. And we heard them and listened to them, but it was pitch black. You couldn't see the front of your hand in front of your face. And all of the buffalo came filtering down around us. The herd then surrounded us and then passed us. And all of that was just sensory. You couldn't see a thing. And then after they'd passed, all you could hear were the pitter-patter of the Paw, paws of the lions now in pursuit of these buffalo just walking behind them. So it was this, without seeing a thing, you could hear and sense and be part of it. You had the smell of the buffalo, the sound of these lions coming past. It was just magnificent, really, really a different type of sighting, if I could call it that. No, definitely. Sounds amazing. You paint a very good picture. So I'm um, sure a lot of people will be going, wow, need to get to get over to Africa now. <laughs> so what about any moments where you felt a little bit uncomfortable or maybe a little bit afraid or anxious? I'm sure uh, you've... Yeah, I mean, being out in, in, in the wild is always a crazy thing. And, and it's the funniest thing is the smallest things will be the ones to get you most. So my most anxious moment that I had was two years ago, just before all of the lockdown happened. And I was in my room and I stepped on a massive scorpion that then stung me in the foot. And from where I was, I started having an anaphylactic reaction to it. Now I've encountered lions on foot. I've had them charge me, elephants charge me, rhinos charge me, all these massive things. And now this thing that's this big could be taking me right out of the game off the bat. And the pain I experienced was next level and not being allowed to cross the border back into South Africa to get medical attention for eight hours didn't help the fact. But what was crazy was through all of that, 
I thought my life was going to end in the ambulance on the way to the hospital because the guy was driving like a bat out of hell on the worst road possible in the most old clapped out ambulance you've ever seen with a student in the back trying to ask me questions and she couldn't even, she didn't know what she was supposed to ask. So she'd ask him, he would say to her in Zulu what the what he, she needs to ask, then she would translate that to me and they'd relay the questions around. So it was it was a comedy of errors, but it was I'm, I'm here to tell the story. So that's always a good <laughs> well, that's good news, isn't it? <laughs> so, what what is your favorite animal? I mean, because there's so many amazing creatures out there. So, so what is your personal personal favorite? Oh, a leopard is the one thing that grabs my heart all along. I started doing safari when I was young, four or five years old. My first leopard that I got to see was at the age of 16. And I had done safari three times a year. They were just elusive. They are elusive. But a friend of mine, they owned a reserve called Londolozi, which is a, a, a prime property in the Sabi Sands uh, in South Africa. And they took us for a weekend and we drove in that day. And the first thing we saw was a leopard archetypal stretched and strewn over a branch. I, I just wanted to cry, but I couldn't because I was with all the boys and you just got to keep the head <laughs> and act cool. <laughs> but it was truly spectacular. So what is it about the leopard you like so much? I think the, the elusive nature of it is, is the one thing, and it was so difficult for us, for me to find. Um, it has always just been such a beautiful creature uh, that has been painted so beautifully in documentaries, but... I was never, never had the privilege of really getting to see one. A leopard is just the, the, the cream of the crop, the beauty of it. And then the more I spent time, the reserve I spent about six years at was Sabi Sabi Private Game Reserve. And from never seeing one for 11 years of safari to seeing two, three a day changes your whole perspective on it. Now you see the personality of it, how it reacts, how it reacts to you. I had leopards that had, they are so intelligent. You look into their eyes and have moments. I remember one moment where we had a leopard that chased a kudu into a fence, which is a large antelope. And what he'd done was he couldn't get it out because it was electrification. So we pulled it out. And when we pulled it out, he charged us because now he's trying to claim back his prize. So we eventually left it nicely for him. And that afternoon I went on safari. He'd been relaxed the whole day. As I pulled into the sighting and started talking to my guests, he recognized my voice and charged me again, saying, <laughs> no, it's not yours, it's mine. So you put it down to what intelligence you do. I put it down to the fact that they are that intelligent that they could recognize my voice over anyone else that wasn't there previously fiddling with his food. That's an incredible story. So, so um, what other, um, so you've got a bucket list, obviously. So you've been to lots of places so far. So what's on your personal bucket list with regard Africa? I think mm, that is a, that's a challenging question. I, again, new reserves and new places are always a bucket list thing for me. There's, there's one part of Tanzania where they have uh, the birthing season. So January, February is a great time for that part of the migration. So the migration that everyone talks about, everyone goes sort of September, August, September to get the crossing, those hectic points where they're crossing the Mara River. But in January, February, that migration goes to a greener part and drops all their babies. So there's like a million wildebeest babies that are born and it is just carnage. There's lions, leopards, cheetah, caracal, everything going after these things. So it is really action filled. And I haven't had the privilege of being able to do that. And I'm looking for any guests. So if anyone wants to come with me, I'll sort it out for you anytime. Very good. So you'd say that would be as or more spectacular than the grand stampede that everyone kind of like is focused on? Yeah, I think, I think it's completely different. I mean, so yeah. the difference being that it's a different thing that people haven't seen. So as a wildlife photographer, just on my own, I want unique images. Yeah. I have seen hundreds of thousands of images of wildebeest crossing a river, crocodiles taking the things, 
I don't say that that's not something to be seen, but I just want to take a different perspective on it and see a different part of the migration because everyone thinks that that's the migration, is that crossing. But that migration is going on every year on a loop the whole time. So it's just a different perspective on it and, and creating something different from my photographic perspective um, than any other images that I've seen. Yeah, no, understood. So it sounds like most of uh, your bucket list kind of like destinations kind of influenced by opportunities to see wildlife in a kind of like a unique kind of perspective. So beyond that part of Tanzania, are there any other kind of like unique places to kind of like check out? So within Africa, there are Ethiopia is a is an absolute treasure trove and really just starting to hit the map. There've been a lot of positions where uh, Ethiopia was untravelable because of internal conflict and then it opens up and there's these highlands. You've got these incredible um, baboons that are there. You've got an Ethiopian fox, which is an uh, Ethiopian wolf, which is the uh, most endangered animals or mammal species in Africa that you can see there. And then a lot of tribes. So these tribes in the Omo Valley that still practice exactly what they've been practicing for thousands of years, doing their thing, wearing traditional headwear. So again, this, this beauty and culture, this beauty in difference and this beauty of connecting with people that are, are so far removed from our way of life. And so I think Ethiopia is a, a great place to visit. So any other unique cultural experiences you would kind of like recommend for anyone? Definitely. So um, in Namibia, which Namibia on its own is a trip that will blow minds just because of the starkness and you're in the oldest desert on the planet and you have these elephants wandering over dunes and lions and seal colonies with brown hyenas going in. So really different, but they've also got a tribe called the Himba tribe that from Stone Age have not changed their ways. They, they wear red okra, which is a, a substance within soil. They put it in their hair and on their skins to protect their skins. And they have these incredible complexions because of it. And they live off of nothing. You sit there and you see their huts and you go, how have you survived for millennia here? I, d I don't understand it, but it is such a spectacular thing. And then to be part of that, uh, at the camps that we stay at, one of them being Sarah Kefema, to get there, you jump on your quad bikes and you go over the dunes in your quad bikes and have a bit of playtime all the way there. And then when you get there, you get serious and the vehicle pulls in with your camera gear because you didn't need to carry that by yourself. And you go with cameras, you take your photos, put the camera gear back in the vehicle and back on the quad bikes and you cruise and go be crazy again. A good way to feel back to your youthful adolescence very quickly. Very good. That sounds amazing. So what would you say is the best part of your job? Uh, reconnecting people with nature. Uh, uh, so many people have asked me, uh, do you get tired of saying the same stories over and over and over again? And the answer is no, because the look on people's faces when they learn something fundamentally true and unknown to them and it wows them so much that it shocks the reality and city life right out of them is amazing so that ability to take people out of their comfort zone watch them get a little bit crazy and and uh, feel a bit of fear while feeling this excitement and happiness that comes along with it just is a, a privilege that i get to experience a lot awesome so what about your normal day? Like, I believe it starts pretty early. And then, as you mentioned before, finishes pretty late as well. So, but what, what's the day actually look like for you? So Damien, the, the day, generally we try and get up before sunrise because the one part that we miss in our lives is trying to sleep in. We try and get as much sleep as we can. And we miss the most beautiful time of the day, which is sunrise. And you have the dawn chorus, the birds calling, life is just waking up and getting going and you feel that when you get going so normally we're up and we're moving by 5 a.m 5 30 a.m we're up and going and then you're out on safari for a few hours depends where we are in the world um, and which point of safari but south african safari is normally sort of 9 30 ish you get back to the lodge 
after having a coffee out in the in the field just to make sure that you keep your personality up because every cup of personality is necessary in the morning yeah. and by the time we get back then there's a big spread of breakfast do you have your eggs your bacon whatever you whatever your liking is and then it's time to either go out on a walk or relax around the lodge i generally am doing stuff with the guests in terms of photographic tuition teaching them about their cameras or we go back out and find something to do that will take up the day and then in the afternoon we go out again for a sunset drive stop for a sundown a gin and tonic a beer or water whatever your preference is and then go into the evening with a spotlight looking for more nocturnal creatures and um, and by the time we get back to camp it's now dinner time and we sit down for a bit of fine dining beautiful under the stars so long as they're out there not some clouds above us and then head off to bed and get ready for the next day. So it's a very full day, but it's about making pockets of time to be present through that, that allows you to not be exhausted by the end of it and yeah. just be appreciative of the time that you've spent. No, it sounds an amazing day. So you were mentioning about photography. So what would be some of your recommendations for the amateur photographer who's looking to capture his best photos. So what kind of, you know, a little bit about the kind of gear, basic gear they kind of need, and then, you know, what they should kind of do to prepare for taking great shots. But the, the first thing is being comfortable with the camera. So, I mean, it's not going to help if you don't know how your camera works. So basic understanding of your camera is always going to get you ahead of the game. Wildlife photography is very much about being ready for a situation when it happens. It's unlike portrait photography or architectural photography or anything like that, where I can say to a model, please move here. Let's move the lights around here. I can change the lighting now and do different things. But in nature, we have to be prepared for everything that's happening when it's happening in a moment. My role as a guide is to prepare people for that. So with basic knowledge, I will then say, guys, get ready for this. The leopard's about to move up onto that termite mount. So we're going to go around this side so that the light is right. Okay, go, 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 go. And I'll help them with, with settings and putting it all together. The other thing is having equipment. The best camera you have in the world is the one you have on you. There is not one that is better than another unless it's not with you because it doesn't help. Uh, my preference is Sony Alpha and I've, tried everything and it is just the best in terms of what I've used. Um, and a lot of this equipment is really expensive. If you're doing a once in a lifetime trip and you are, you want to get some beautiful images out of it. My suggestion is to go out and rent a good lens for the time that you're there. That way you don't have to spend $10,000 on a lens. You can spend $1,000 on two weeks of using the lens and still get the best images and return it to the people and say, next time I'll try a different lens. And that will give you a little bit of to and fro. But the bigger the camera doesn't mean the better the image. So some of the bridge cameras, which are smaller cameras with the built-in zoom lenses are amazing for these situations too. No, very good recommendations. So now let's talk about the um, status of conservation in Africa at the moment. So what's your perspective? Like obviously there's still a number of uh, species endangered and threatened. Um, so have you seen an improvement over the 13 years you've been a guide? No, unfortunately, Damien, there's only decline that's happening. Um, the pressures because of overpopulation and the greed mentality that we as a species have, have accumulated has led to the demise of, of many different animals. I've unfortunately seen numerous uh, rhino that have been poached and animals that get taken out for, for no reason whatsoever. And then loss of habitat is a huge thing. As we grow as a population, so space is minimized and all they need to survive is space. We feel like we need to create breeding programs because they They've been doing it for thousands of years, millions of years. They can breed. We're all capable of it. We're quite good at finding a way to do that. It's just about space for everyone to, to live together. Um, so my personal opinion is that conservation travel, through traveling and doing these trips and safaris, have a major influence on 
try to maintain those areas and keep them wild because it adds a monetary value to it. Now through COVID, a lot of places have gone under. So what's going to happen to those pieces of land? Unless somebody will go and fill that gap, which at the moment nobody wants to because there's very little tourism moving around, it will turn into farmlands, which means monoculture, which means you lose all the biodiversity that's within an area. So conservation travel is a huge part of it and a huge part of what I like to bring to things is people understanding what is happening around and even getting them involved. So on one of my itineraries, we stop at a, a beautiful place called Marataba Conservation Camps. And they actually offer a, an activity where you can pay a bit extra and you, be, you are part of a rhino darting. So they take off with a helicopter, they dart the rhino. You are physically part of it because you have to roll the rhino. You have to be there to help to cover the rhino, to help the vets get the data they need to take DNA samples, to microchip the horn, to notch the ears. And it brings people closer to it and allows them to understand what and why. But along with it, they get to touch a living, breathing rhino, which is an experience that I can never explain to anyone because it is so unique and so different. So that aspect of conservation is the money and you get that experience in return. And that is, it's priceless. It really is. No, you're right. So, well, definitely, as you said, we need to encourage more people to go off and experience things because that's when they get actually the real perspective on what's what we're going to lose if we don't take care of it today. So, yeah. um, well, let's hope this COVID gets over quite quickly so more and more people can go back to Africa because um, we don't want to be losing any more wildlife, do we now? Yeah, exactly. So, so to close out, just talking about Africa generally, you know, what for you, you know, why do you think people should, you know, make Africa at least a once in a lifetime kind of a trip? I think the culture here is... The, the wildlife speaks for itself, but I think what people are so afraid of is that you come over to Africa and you, you don't have the creature comforts of home. But when you get here, the people are so friendly and the culture and the warmth and the love that you get from arriving in these places and seeing these people is just as great as the impact of seeing the animals. And it is often misunderstood or, or, or not ex unexpected part of the travel that you see is this real richness of happiness and love. People just see poverty from outside. But when you get here, you see how rich people are just by the smiles they put on their faces. Poverty is a Western term that we go, this person doesn't have enough money to buy food. But these people, a lot of them don't need to buy food. They grow the food, they make it themselves, they're part of it. They have time with their family, they have time to sit around and talk nonsense and, and do the things that we seem to have lost touch with as we run the rat race to try and make as much money and find a way to retire as early as possible and think about our impending death. Yeah, no, very good point. So now let's switch gears a little bit. Um, you have an extensive experience, uh, obviously, in uh, Kruger National Park. So I'd like to get some insights from you for people who are considering traveling there. So firstly, why do you think, you know, if you're traveling to South Africa, you should definitely put Kruger National Park on the list? Well, firstly, Kruger National Park is one of the oldest parks in the world. And um, it was basically separated and created as a national park in 1902, so a long time ago. And this park is quite spectacular. There's a large part of it which is public, so people can drive in and do their own safari and from their own vehicles or a rented vehicle. Um, but then there are the private sections which have been running and have crafted safari in its normal form that we see it now, this luxury safari, photographic safari, as it is now. And it's been done for the longest time here. So you're looking at, I mean, the lodge I've worked at has been operational for 45 years almost. I mean, it's an incredible amount of time for animals to have become accustomed to what you are doing. Yep. So 
the difference is, is in Kruger, if I'm driving in in my own vehicle and I pull up and a lion doesn't like me, I can't go into the bush after him. He just walks 30 meters off and he's gone. In a private reserve, I'm able to take the vehicle off the road and follow him. And because he has been since a cub and through generations of lions, being accustomed to these vehicles, they don't care about them. So you can be 15 meters behind it, following it, crashing over trees and everything. And he's just going to carry on as if nothing is happening around him. And that sort of feel is incredible. We were talking about Serengeti and everything. Most of those places, you are not allowed off the road. There are concessions where you can go off and you have to choose those very wisely. The other part is that those any national park can get congested. So I actually saw a photo on Instagram today where there were two cheetahs crossing a road and the, the pho photographer had put it in, spot the animal, because there were about 50 vehicles and two tiny little cheetahs in the middle of these things because people freak out. Whereas in a private reserve in the Greater Kruger National Park, which adjoins the park with no fences, you have the freedom and the maximum vehicle density of about three vehicles in a sighting. So you have the time, you have the ability to park yourself. And as a photographer, that gives me the run to be able to put you in the best place to get the best photo possible. Okay. So from your perspective, so if you have the ability and a little extra money, definitely invest in one of the private, private reserves. So because you have greater access to animals. So even with them, what's the difference because they're different locations so how do you choose where in the kruger national park you actually go so what are the differences i think i think again it comes down to price points so places like the sabi sands game reserve generally have a much higher price point than say the baluli or the Klesiri, which are further north um, and it's finding what's right for you in terms of that financial backing yep. you would in my opinion and, and it is a humble one is that you will get a greater experience spending three days at a private reserve at a premium cost than you would spending two weeks in the kruger driving yourself around and um, just by what you'll see and the quality of what you see it's not about quantity it's about quality and what you'll learn because also driving yourself around and this is coming from a guide if I go to a new place, I want a local guide to be teaching me and telling me about what I'm seeing. Otherwise, I'm, all I really am doing is looking and not learning. So that, that for me makes a, a great big difference. Um, Sabi Sands is definitely a, a hot spot on anyone's list and should be on anyone's list. Understood. So let's go to some basic kind of information like uh well number one how do you how do you get to the kruger national park uh, it, it, yeah carry on no no I just so there, there are multiple multitude of airports there's an airport that's about two hours away from the park or an, about an hour away from a, a certain entrance and a lot of the private reserves have airfields where there are private charters that fly into and there's actually a airport within Kruger National Park called Skukuza Airport um, which you can fly directly from Johannesburg and into the Kruger National Park and your game viewing begins immediately as you get out of the plane so depending on your price point I've done I do a lot of trips with private private aircraft private jets where you can climb in and we go when we want to go and land at these private airfields but alternatively even driving yourself out there is a pleasure. The roads in South Africa are quite spectacular and quite enjoyable to, to be on. Okay. So, and what time of year for you is your favorite time of year or preferred time of year to go? Yeah, again, your peak season is generally around the European and American summer holidays. Um, one, because it's winter here, so you have less rain it's drier and things start congregating around water holes. So you're, it's easier to see things through a dry bush that doesn't have a lot of foliage in the way between you and them. And secondly, it is then all hands on deck because animals are taking strain because it's dry. So you have a lot of predator activity at the same time. But to spin that on its head, 
a great time is when it's green season. It's a bit hotter, but photographically, you get these deep, rich greens that come out that give you an ability to see stuff, and it just changes the perspective completely. Um, so my favorite time would probably be about September, September, October, just before the first rains come because the animals are at their craziest and everything is pumping and you can almost be guaranteed to see amazing things at that time of the year. No, oh, awesome. And what should people pack and, you know, how can I get ready for a safari? So people often think that because you're coming to Africa, it's hot. If you're coming in winter, bring warm clothing. The lodges love you when you don't because they end up selling you a lot from their shop at a very good price. Yeah. And then you take it back and you market all the lodges for them when you're wearing it back at home. Um, so packing correctly and checking the temperatures at each of the places is a very important part of preparation for it. But comfortable clothes and clothes shoes, good walking shoes in case you are gonna do any walks. Um, but comfortable clothes are perfect. A lot of the places say don't wear bright clothing and blues and whites. If you're going up to the Masai Mara or to the Serengeti, there is a fly called the Tsitsi fly, which do bite and they do go for the blues and blacks uh, in terms of those colors if you're wearing them. But if you're down in South Africa, really color makes no difference. The more neutral it is, the cooler it is. There's a reason why we wear these neutral colors in the bushes actually for for cooling um, and also just not just look like a sore thumb walking out there yeah. binoculars are very important and then a camera for those who are interested in photography definitely for those that aren't guys you're not even going to look at most of your photos your guide is probably going to take photos if you're with me i would give you my photos and take photos of you because the best camera in the world are these two things stuck to your face and the best memory card is your brain. And that's where you store your experiences. It's very tough. It's easy for me to look through a viewfinder at what's going on because I get to see it all the time. If you're out here once, you don't want to miss a moment because you were fiddling with the setting and you want to throw the camera out the car. So, you know, you got to weigh that up um, and figure it out from there. No, that's a good point. I remember going on a tour and the person said, first time round, leave your cameras behind just experience because you're going to miss a lot of things if you're worried about your camera you now second time when you look, you've had the experience then go use your camera so that's very good advice so uh, you know use your eyes check it out and really enjoy the experience so so you mentioned there are a number of options so there are lodges and there are camps so do you have any kind of like you know, you me mentioned uh, one, one location. Um, are there any other recommendations you have for people? Yeah, so Sabi Sabi Private Game Reserve, where I spent a lot of my time, is one of the most spectacular places you could ever visit. The game viewing is phenomenal. The lodges are out of this world. And the, the sense of space and luxury that you have all in one package is just magnificent. But there are countless countless other lodges within these places that can be uh, visited and what i love doing with guests especially if it may only be the one time that you come to africa is not to just stick to one destination like a south africa what we could do is tailor a trip where we would do some cape town some kruger national park then fly in a jet through to uh, botswana and experience the delta and being out on water and in dugout canoes and moving through like that, and then heading to the desert to finish off in the dunes of Namibia. So you can do a multi-destination trip. And um, obviously the expense comes in high, but the experience is massive. And for people that are time restrained and probably won't be able to do it more than once, it is a great way to get a big experience into one, into one trip. So even uh, say you're just going to locate in South Africa, um, so you think it's a good idea to kind of like split your time between a couple of lodges so you get, you know, a broader experience? Absolutely. Uh, so even my, that one itinerary, the one set departure that I do have is Sabi Sabi and Marataba. The two reserves are, are completely different. 
the the one is far flatter and the other Maritaba has a big the Waterberg mountain range running through it the experiences are different Sabi Sands is very quality deep in game viewing where Maritaba is more conservation based more time to be out on foot we would do more walking we would spend time looking at the smaller things we might dart a rhino we may go looking for snares on a snare patrol along a fence line and you start to understand what goes into the conservation effort of looking after places like this okay incredible so what do you think should be your minimum time to really get the best experience in going to kruger national park i think at least seven days because of the variety and the pace you really you can see a lot in two days you could see the big five in two days but you're going to be race, racing from one point to another from pillar to post to try and get to sighting so being able to say okay i have seven days i've got three days in this reserve and four days in that and you can unpack your bags and you can get comfortable you can get to know the people in the lodges and like i said one of the biggest things about africa is how beautiful the people are so being able to expand that and then see the same animals in different environments and how they work and how they look just is a beautiful thing to do the more time you can spend the better 10 days would be a really good amount of time where you would leave feeling i'm good now i can go to cape town and go and indulge in a couple of the vineyards down there maybe see a penguin flutter around in the ocean and enjoy some fine downing by the coast no very good recommendation so what do you think um, is, you know, beyond the big five, what other kind of animals are kind of like, you know, things to be on the lookout for? It's, it's not just about the animals. It's about how they're interacting with one another. So being able to, again, with time, to be able to spend time with these animals and watch what they're doing and see an elephant feeding on one thing and then changing his behavior to feeding on another or seeing animals interact with one another is a big thing because you can see these animals in a zoo. But to see them doing what they are doing in their natural environment is what brings it to life. So your bucket list could be the big five, but then there's the little five, which are all for the namesake being called little. So the ant lion, the leopard tortoise, the uh, elephant shrew, the buffalo weaver and the leopard, oh, I've said leopard tortoise, or get to whichever one it is. But so you've got your little five, you've got birds, the birds here are beautiful. And for those who don't, are not birders or twitches that start losing their mind when there's a new bird around, there are a lot of colorful birds and a lot of interesting birds to be, to learn about. And again, it's about the, how they interact with the environment that makes it special. So if you go with the idea of, no expectation, just learning and being present, you will come away with the richest experience of your life. No, it sounds incredible. So any, so, so what about your days on safari? Um, so, so do you be a mixture of driving safari? So you mentioned walking. So what other ways can you kind of like experience your time in the Kruger National Park? So most of it is is by vehicle or, or by foot. Um, there are a couple of camps that will offer like Maritaba, offer some boating activities where you cruise along the river and it's beautiful because you've got some snacks, you've got a drink in your hand. It's, it's very chilled and enjoyable. And like I was talking about Botswana, where you can have dugout canoes, you do fishing excursions, things like that, where, where you, you're expanding the, the idea. But a lot of the time, what I try and do with the guests is, is create experiences. So instead of having lunch at the lodge, is we, we pack a beautiful lunch that's been prepared by the lodge and we have it on a rock with a gorgeous tree out in the middle of nature and just enjoy it there rather than being stuck in the same place you're going to be for the next couple of days, just keeping it, keeping it real and, and really getting into it. Yeah. Well, it sounds like Kruger is definitely an amazing place. Um, so... Um, any things else you would like to mention about, you know, reasons why you should visit Kruger? 
just the fact that it is an experience on its own. To be up close and personal with these incredible creatures is just, it's a privilege. Every day of my life, I see it as a privilege. And when you have an animal let you into its space and you get to see the texture of its skin to smell it, even if it's the smell of dung, it, it, it's a rich experience that goes far beyond a sight. It is a sensory experience. And Kruger is just a massive area. I mean, we're talking about 5 million acres of unfenced land. It's only surrounded by a border fence. So this natural system moves and does what it needs to as it's going. And when we get to the private reserves, we actually understand the dynamics of the individual prides of lions, of the individual leopards, what their history is, who they mated with, whose babies are whose, how it happened, territorial battles, how those moved. So all of that information is also entrenched within these guided experiences. Okay, awesome. Well, Richard, it's been amazing talking to you. You've given some uh, inspirational ideas, advice, and I'm sure a lot of people are now going to be wanting to book their trip to Africa. So can you tell us how people can find you online? Yeah, I, you can find me by my name, Richard Digavere, um, on Instagram or on Facebook. Happy to connect through that. Otherwise, go check out my uh, website, which is www.numinosity.earth. Numinosity is the feeling of fear and awe that is experienced in moments of grandeur with nature, is what the word numinous means. And that's what I hope to give people and allow them time to journal, to meditate, to be part of that whole system while experiencing these incredible things and traveling with a bit more intention. So you can check me out there, these trips there, and I also do privately customized trips wherever, through whatever and whatever your budget is. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Richard. It's been amazing. Thank you, Damien. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate your time.